urging Britain to stay in the European Union have emerged. He wrote it a couple of days before he decided to back the Leave campaign. MPs have criticised Jeremy Corbyn for failing to provide consistent leadership in tackling anti-Semitic abuse within the Labour Party. And the US Secretary of State, John Kerry, will attend talks in London today with British officials on the future of Syria and Yemen. Well, now, uh, time to discuss those stories and other some of the week's big political stories. I'm joined by Caroline Wheeler, political editor with The Express, and Sonia Soda, chief leader writer with The Observer. Very good morning to you both. Well, uh, so much going on. We were just saying, weren't we, before we came on air there, can't really remember the beginning <laughs> of the week. It's all upon us. So, well, Trump, Syria, Brexit. Does that just about cover it, Caroline, or is, you know, you choose? Well, there's lots. I mean, I think um, one of the things in terms of being a political journalist at the moment you just can't seem to get o away from is the issue of Brexit. It. And thinking back to the beginning of the week, one of the big uh, issues was about whether or not MPs, and, and still in fact remains a big issue, are going to get a vote uh, on the issue at all before she triggers Article 50. And yet again today we've seen people talking about that and it's, a, it's definitely going to dominate the agenda with this campaign basically being launched by various, what they've been called, Ramoners, haven't they? Mm. And also... Ramoners, I think, some <laughs> people are saying. <laughs> but bit, bit by bit, aren't we, we're seeing some of the the so-called, if you can call it that, moderate levers peeling mm. off. And this, this very potent argument they're deploying, saying, well, wasn't the vote about taking back control for Parliament? And isn't this about the sovereignty of Parliament? Therefore, we want to vote at some point. Absolutely. I think in the last sort of two or three weeks, we really started to see some of the battle lines kind of shape up. At the start of the summer, it was all Brexit means Brexit. And there weren't too many Conservatives sort of straying away from that. But as you say, we're starting to see some divisions within the Conservative ranks. And I actually find the argument that, you know, this was a vote for sovereignty. Surely that means Parliament getting a say very powerful. And if you look at what government ministers are saying, the strongest argument that they seem to have against Parliament getting a say about the terms of our Brexit negotiation is to say, well, you know, it's like poker. If, if we were in a room, I wouldn't be showing you playing poker, I wouldn't be showing you my cards. But I think that's to sort of misunderstand the nature of this negotiation. So this really isn't going to be cooked up by two people sitting in a closed room. If you look at what's going on in the European side, the Europe 27 European countries have to come to a unanimous agreement about about what their negotiating position is for Article 50. So there's going to be loads that's in the public well, domain keep, about this, keep, lots that's leaked. I think the idea that Parliament doesn't get a say because it all has to be top mm. secret doesn't quite wash for me. But you keep getting a dose of reality, don't you, from the high halls of the European institutions. I was thinking, you know, Donald Tusk's comments the other day ahead of the European Council saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I paraphrase, I don't know what you're talking about in the UK about shades of Brexit. He said, there's hard Brexit or no Brexit. That's your choice. So much for the not, you know, not revealing your cards. This is our position. We know how tough it's going to be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think one of the really interesting things is that for absolutely months and months and months around the sort of referendum campaign, we were writing stories about these massive divisions within the Conservative Party and how it was going to basically tear the Conservative Party apart. I think people were then really surprised to see that when Theresa May came in, there was this kind of smoothing of the waters, you know, a kind of feeling that some of the Brexiteers weren't really up for a fight. They'd won the big battle and actually they were quite happy to let her lead from the front. Now we're actually starting to see some of those from the Remain sign kind of kicking back, you know, your Anna Soubries, for example. And they couch these kind of phrases about soft Brexit, hard Brexit, or is it clean and smooth Brexit now we're hearing about? And that now seems to be this kind of argument that's being made. Let's throw the Foreign Secretary into this, Boris Johnson, of mm. course, in this emergence today uh, in Tim Shipman's uh, new book, of uh, an article he wrote, what, two days before he declared for leave, making uh, an argument for Remain. And we're told, though, that this was some, almost some, you know, the old list exercise, the pros and cons. Mm. Or, or um, do you think it tells us more about Boris's ambition? I think it tells us more about Boris's political ambition. I mean, I think Boris's friends have sort of made a heroic attempt to sort of say, well, this was actually Boris weighing up the pros and cons. I mean, I'm a journalist. I've never written two different <laughs> columns or two different editorials to try and figure out what you think. I think, I mean, there's absolutely, you know, fair enough if Boris was going to try and figure out what he thought. He might have written something up in private. But the fact that these two columns must have been in circulation amongst some people for Tim Shipman to get a hold of them suggests to me that it's very much about, you know, he could have run with either two days before, and he was taking political advice and political soundings on what would be best for his career. So I think, you know, it, it tells us 
something that I feel we already knew about Boris, which is that the way that he's played this referendum debate really has been to do with his his ambitions rather than his feelings Although about the European Union. if you read Union. what Tim wrote today, and we've, we've just spoken to Tim as well about this, I mean, actually what he's saying is that, you know, he was unconvinced by the arguments that he'd come up with. Uh, I think there was even a suggestion that they made him feel sick, which uh, is another revelation which I believe is due to come out. Um, but also um, that they're speaking to Ben Wallace, who was his campaign advisor, who'd actually advised him that actually coming out for Brexit would damage his chances of becoming Prime Minister, which is interesting because I think we've all assumed that it was all done for a kind of very kind of pointed sort of political end. The suggestion being that if he went for Brexit, he was going to associate himself with the clowns or the so-called clowns like Nigel Farage and that that was going to be quite damaging to him. I mean, I think he's quite a cerebral character. I mean, I, I can see, you know, I think we've all done it occasionally when we've got a big decision to make that we've written down a list, pros, cons, I appreciate it. This is a bit different to writing a whole article. <laughs> Tell me, I mean, now in his job, Foreign Secretary, I mean, he's making quite a splash mm. over Syria. Do you think yeah. he's promising more than he can deliver? He's got this summit uh, today. Your Secretary of State, amongst others, coming over and discussing how to protect the civilians in Aleppo. Yeah, well, he's actually going quite far in what he's saying. So he's saying that the UK should be sort of considering the idea of, of no-fly zones. And, you know, I think if anyone looks at the terrible images emerging from Aleppo and what's been going on in Syria over the last few years, you can't help but feel that there's got to be something more that the UK can be doing. And I suspect that that's where it's coming from, from Boris. However, I mean, he has been knocked back a bit by number 10 yep. on some of this stuff over the last week and I think that's because there is this well first of all I think it's because I think May Theresa May is very cautious when it comes to foreign policy probably even more so than David Cameron or Barack Obama but secondly I think there is this very big diplomatic question which is we've now got into a stage where, where Russia is um, you know is bombing Aleppo saying that they're doing it to shore up Assad um, and uh, or rather kind of saying it that they're doing it to kind of um, uh, tackle kind of uh, ISIS but really you know they're shoring up Assad and you know it, it, it raises this very big diplomatic question if we say we're going to go in and create no fly zones what does that mean when you see a sort of Russian airplane violate, violating That's that space question, does isn't it? I mean, that put us at war with Russia and, and, and Caroline I mean, Boris Johnson accepts it's really down to the Americans if the Americans aren't going to join in Britain can't enforce one on its own absolutely and obviously there's a stumbling block in the way there you know we've got a presidential election that's basically happening in what couple of weeks now so ultimately nothing can happen until we know who's going to be the next president of the United States I mean it's going to impact on everything foreign policy included so I mean it's a difficult one I mean you're also seeing some sort of caution from some of the other sort of uh, French um, foreign leaders kind of cautioning saying they're skeptical about this stance but clearly Boris is really kind of leading the way he's seen those pictures you know he's saying it cannot go on and he thinks there's been a mood change really since um, the issue was last taken to Parliament in terms of endorsing military action we'll see what emerges from today. You mentioned the United States, so we've got to touch on the uh, latest twists and turns in the presidential campaign. What do you make of um, Donald Trump saying overnight, you know, Hillary's on drugs and also his, his, his accusers um, about um, sexual abuse, alleged sexual abuse and making it all up? It's just, I mean, it's astonishing, these stories that keep emerging. I mean, we hear, you know, any couple of weeks ago that basically he's talking about his, you know, power of celebrity, how it's enabled him to get, you know, close and up and personal with women, then this string of people coming out and saying that they feel that they've been abused by him. And now this suggestion that Hillary Trump, you know, is somehow taking drugs, that she was pumped up before the election, before one of the debates and then could barely get to her car afterwards. I mean, it's just terrifying that these are the kind of issues that the, the kind of uh, the public in America are going to be deciding upon. It is all rather, I mean, kind of depressing for those that would like to see some so political popular. debate going on here. But, I mean, do you think Hillary Clinton, though, understanding that she's not, let's to say the very least, enormously popular, even amongst many Democrats, that she's just taking the view now, I've just got to stay quiet here and let this man cook his own goose? Uh, well, I, I mean, I don't think she's exactly stayed quiet. I think both she and actually Michelle Obama have condemned what Trump's been saying about it's what's said about women in the past in the very strongest of terms. I mean, I think that the kind of stuff that Trump has been saying over the last week is kind of the mark of a desperate man who knows he's about to go on to lose a presidential election. I think he's the sort of stuff that he's saying. I think it's stuff that will appeal to some of his core voters who won't be shifting from him, whatever they think at this sort of stage in the context. And I think it's a sign 
kind of somebody who's sort of given up on trying to attract undecideds. It's really striking, actually, if you look at a map of voting intention by gender, if you look at the way that women will vote, Hillary Clinton will absolutely walk the election. Trump only wins by about four states. The map is kind of a mirror image if just men were voting, you know, according to how they say that they would vote in the polls. So it feels like Trump has sort of, you know, ditched the idea of, of, of winning over undecided in this context, co contest and is, you know, just resorting to some quite, I mean, for, for a, pres a US presidential candidate to say this election is rigged is so deeply irresponsible and in terms could, of the stuff that that incites. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just want to get back uh, to these shores and to, to Brexit again, or Skexit as it's sometimes called, and just <laughs> talk, to, um, talk to the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, and she at the conference, at the SNP's conference, banging that drum again for a second independence referendum, saying everything's changed since the Brexit vote. Yeah, and to be fair, she's been really consistent on this message ever since, you know, we woke up on that morning on the 24th of June, very clear that Scotland didn't vote for Brexit. I think 66% of Scots wanted to remain. Um, and, you know, the, the deep irony would be if Brexit then causes the breakup of the union. I mean, what she's saying is that, you know, this but isn't what... she wouldn't what... win at the moment. I mean, the polls are, OK, you didn't want to leave the European Union, but they don't want to leave the United Kingdom either. No, that's right. Right. But she's what she's now kind of slightly changed her tack, I think, this morning as well, talking about the idea that Scotland should get its own trade deal with the, um, the EU, which is another way of saying that she wants access to the single market, which is, of course, the big sort of hot potato at the moment is what's going to happen in terms of our access to that and their access to that. And talking about putting ambassadors and trade envoys in. I mean, it's very and interesting, interesting tack. Talking to Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, uh, about kind of joining mm. together on that. I mean, it just would be extraordinary. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think still Sturgeon's in quite a tricky position, actually, because she's in a position where she's got to pull on every lever that's available to her to get Theresa May to have a dialogue with her about what Brexit means for Scotland. But the problem is that, that the, the, the levers or the threats, however you want to look at them, just aren't that credible. So a second independence referendum, as you said, it looks like she'd lose that. And, and Sturgeon is far too canny a politician to go to the polls if it looks like she's going to lose. In terms of a separate trade deal for Scotland or Scotland remaining part of the single market, I mean, it's just fantasy, really, because if you look at where the European Union's coming from, there are several very important European countries like Spain, Belgium, who've got separatist movements of their own, and they don't want to talk to Scotland individually. They don't want to give an idea to their own separatist movements that you could split off from Spain, say, and you'll still get a very sweet deal from the European Union. So she's in a tricky spot because she's got to try and sort of threaten something to get May to come to the table. But those threats aren't, aren't very credible when you sort of try yeah. to pick I, them I, apart. And, and I put it to her, if she held that referendum, an independence referendum, a second one and lost, well, whatever happened to David Cameron would presumably happened to her. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is a very dangerous game that she's playing. And also, I mean, is there really an appetite for another referendum? I and mean, we've just seen one in the United Kingdom. Before that, we saw one in Scotland only a, a year or so before that. I mean, it's, you know, you can understand that she's using those leverages. That's what politicians do. They find a threat and they beat somebody over the head with it until they exceed to their demands. But, you know, as you say, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's one that's not really going to get her very far. Well, thanks for helping us cut through all the rhetoric, Caroline. We Sonia Soda, thank you very much indeed. And you're watching Monaghan on Sky News coming up.